And it's working. Hallelujah. Well, welcome, everybody. We're going to talk about positive mindset today. Um, before we start very quickly, um, I, I, I wanted to introduce myself so that you understand the perspective um, I'm going to take on this topic. My name is Steph Pelletier. I'm actually an ex-corporate um, executive, if you like. I worked in finance uh, for um, quite a few years, about seven years. Um, then I moved to the media industry, but long short of it, um, I became a coach and a therapist. Um, the reason for that is that I was always super stressed and anxious, and I found that I was juggling all the time. I wasn't super happy, to be very honest. I felt that I was in a complete rat race. Uh, I'm not going to lie, I experienced burnout. I struggled with dep depression at one time, um, about 10 years ago. And um, I really wanted to understand how can I pull myself out of this depression, but how can I make sure that once I feel better, the next 40 years of my life are, are more pleasant, you know, are calmer, are filled with more joy. And I went and studied the science of happiness uh, at Berkeley University in California. And I found this so extraordinary, this approach of happiness from a very scientific pers uh, perspective uh, that I decided to make it my mission in life to help people live happier lives. And what I do is uh, quite off the beaten tracks, to be honest. Uh, my approach is very holistic. It always includes the body, the state of the nervous system, the mind. How can we um, change the cabling in our mind and trick our brain to actually have a more positive experience of life? And the heart, you know, what is it that you desire? What is it that matters to you? And so I call it super fast therapy, really, because uh, my aim is to give people very, very quick results, usually within a couple of weeks. I want people to start feeling better. And it works. It's pretty amazing. So today we're going to talk about positive mindset and uh, really how you can build that mindset. Uh, we're going to look at definitions. What, what, you, what does it mean to have a positive mindset? What are the barriers? Because it's not that simple. And also, super importantly, I want to start by highlighting the biggest mistakes people make when they want to look after their mindsets. One trap out of the way. And then I'm going to share with you five tips super effortless and easy, not very time consuming, to really start fueling your mindset with a lot of optimism and positivity. And I really insist on the fact that I want these tips to be easy because the reality, guys, is that, you know, that life that I had, the, that constant juggling, the rat race, being under pressure all the time, I understand that this is reality for most of us. So I don't want to add more things to your already busy to-do list, but give you little things that practiced with a bit of consistency, and it's easy to do because they're not very time consuming, will create a massive change for you. So before we start, I would love to ask you guys um, in the chat box, um, are you a glass half full or a glass half empty? And I would love to see your answers. Because let me tell you, before I studied the science of happiness, I knew I was a glass half empty person, you know? I was always overthinking situations from quite a negative perspective, always catastrophizing. I didn't want to do that, but naturally that's what I was doing. So please let me know in the chat box. Okay, oh, we've got plenty of half full. That's great. Some half empty and it's okay. It's absolutely okay. Half empty more often. Okay, that's fine. Half full both. Yeah, you're right. Sometimes it's both. You know, some days we've got this great mindset that really pushes us forward and some days oh, the glass is bloody empty there's no resources right so really what i want to start by telling you is that there is no such thing as the glass half full or the glass half empty really and let me explain to you um why y your brain is a little bit like a connected power grid uh, between neurons uh, there are little cables and actually it's an electrical board with lots of cables and every single time you repeat a thought or you experience a thought, an emotion, or you, or you uh, act in a certain way, the neurons fire together and they f when they fire together, they wire together and they create a little cable. Now, the more you're going to repeat 
that pattern of thought, pattern of emotion, of pattern of behavior, the cable is going to strengthen and strengthen and strengthen until it becomes a, a motorway, if you like. It becomes the default route. And then you've created a new pattern, a new habit. Now, think that there is uh, a behavior that you want to change and it's already a habit. The cable is very strong. The less you're going to follow that pathway and behave in a, in a different manner, the weaker that pathway is going to become until it completely disintegrates. Yeah, it does require a bit of effort. But really what I'm trying to say is that that is called neuroplasticity. We can completely change the cabling in our brain. And as a result, we can change our mindset and we can uh, totally change our approach to life and the way we perceive life and the way we respond to it. The brain is a little bit like a garden, if you like. We can remove weeds, the weeds of the patterns of thoughts or emotions or actions we don't particularly like or that are not serving us, and we can build new ones. Because the reality is that 95% of our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors are the same as yesterday. Isn't that insane? Unless we decide to change them. And 70% of our waking hours, we are on, we are on autopilot. We don't consciously decide to say that thing, to act in this manner. The brain has got like uh, programs uh, that it fires. And we just sort, sort of react to our environment, if you like. And maybe you find yourself in that situation where maybe you're having a conversation with someone and actually it's not a very pleasant conversation. And you might say something and the moment you finish your sentence, you tell yourself, oh no, what have I said that? Not so good. Right? It's simply that autopilot function that fires out. What's really, and, and it's okay, right? What matters is to become more aware of it and to actually change the program so that what fires out is, you know, serving you best. You have the power to change your mindset and actually live a much more joyful life. Because in the science of happiness, um, the definition is very clear. Happiness has very little to do with what's going on in your life. It's actually your ability to notice and enjoy the good stuff of life and to bounce back from difficulty. And in order to notice and enjoy, you need to have quite a good mindset. So I'm going to share with you techniques today to build that positive mindset. But before, what does it mean to have a positive mindset? Can I ask you guys? Maybe in the chat box, what does it mean to you to have a positive mindset? The definition is not complicated, uh, but there are quite a few parts to it. And I'd love to see what it means to you personally. And I, I find that depending on the challenges that we face at certain points in our life, we might have a def different definition. Uh, feeling happy and peaceful, hmm? yeah? Absolutely. You can't feel happy and peaceful if you don't have a positive mindset. Absolutely. Oh, I really like that, Joanne, having a can-do attitude, right? Challenge, bring it on. I can. Being optimistic, having faith in yourself and in maybe others or in life. Yeah, that's a good one. Anybody else would like to share? These are good ones. Yes, I can. Looking for the solution rather than worry about the problem. I love this, Pauline. Yeah. How you bounce back from adversity, Jennifer, you're absolutely right. The bouncing back is super important. The definition of a positive mindset is a mental and emotional attitude. So you see there is the thinking aspect and the emotional aspect that focuses on the bright side of life and expect positive results. Having a positive mindset is actually part of what we call emotional resilience. It's the ability to approach life's challenges with a positive outlook being able to focus on the bright side, being able to expect positive results, trying to make the most out of potentially bad situations and always trying to see the best in yourself and in other people. Focusing on the goals, not the obstacles. Absolutely, I love that. For me, it's about looking for the good in everything it is. It's about being optimistic and solution focused. Yeah, it's all of that, guys. And again, what is really interesting is that research who have been um, looking at people with a positive mindset, they identified traits and characteristics. People who have a positive mindset, they're optimistic. 
they always try to look for the good. Um, they accept what they can't control. Uh, they let go of the past uh, and they let go of what is outside of their control. And so they let go of the problems and have the ability to focus on the solution and what's ahead of them. They're very resilient and usually they tend to be quite grateful people. And what's quite interesting is that if you have a positive mindset, you have these traits and characteristics, but there is a two way dimension. The moment you decide to work on increasing your optimism, your acceptance, your resilience or your gratitude, you change your mindset uh, positively. So that's what we're going to aim at doing today. But before we do that, I want to share with you the barriers, because when you understand the barriers, it's a massive motivator to actually start doing things differently. Can I ask you guys once more in the chat box? Um, what do you think the purpose of your brain is? So I call it the three pound of tofu in the coconut. Uh, that's my scientific term for that very complicated piece of hardware and software we have. Simply because um, our brain, well, let, let me see your answers first. What do you think um, the, the purpose of your brain is? Because for sure, its purpose is not your happiness. It's not your fulfillment. Na na na. To run the body, to keep us alive, survival. Yeah, yeah I'm, I've got everything that I'm looking for. The only purpose of the brain is survival. And this brain of ours has evolved over millions of years to adapt to the demands of our environment, to the threats uh, that are presented from our environment, to protect us. But our lifestyles have changed so dramatically over the past, I don't know, 100 years, 200 years, I mean, let alone 40 years, right, completely changed, that the brain hasn't had time to adapt to these new demands. And the reality is that that three pound of tofu that we've got in the coconut uh, is 99.9% .9 the same as the brain of cavemen and cave women from the Stone Age. And already without me saying any more, you can already think, oh, wow, surely that's not always so helpful because we live very different lives. Our environments are very different. So let me tell you a few things about this brain of ours. The first element I want to tell you about that is not very helpful for our mindset is that the brain has got a huge negativity bias. Guys, have you noticed how um, Okay. On average, actually, now we know uh, statistically that we have three times more positive than negative experiences in a day. Which ones do you share with your partner or housemates or uh, friends in the evening? Which ones do you think about when you go to bed? We think about the negative ones. The brain is Velcro to negative and Teflon to positive. If there's a good thing happening in your life and a bad thing, it's always going to spot the bad thing. And it's not even going to notice the good thing. But what it also does is that the brain naturally makes the bad look worse than what it actually is. Can I have a little why for yes in the chat box if you experience that on a regular basis? Like, and that is mainly catastrophizing uh, future. You know, we put ourselves in state trying to create scenarios of what tomorrow holds and then and here we go, and before you know it, it's the end of the world, but actually things are never as bad as what we make them. I see plenty of wise. It's okay, it's totally normal. The reason for that is because, think about the caveman in the forest. The brain scans the world 24-7 to look for threats and dangers to protect you. And it protects you by ringing the stress alarm bells, right? And the brain goes, ooh, there's a noise over there. Could be a tiger. Well, if it's not really sure it's a tiger and it doesn't ring the alarm bell, the outcome could be death. And it's learned over the years that if it's not sure, make it look worse than what it is, because at least you're going to survive. That's the negativity bias. We all have it. The second element is that the brain is a recording device. And I'm really sorry, but I said dumb because the brain acts upon every single one of your thoughts. It doesn't care whether what you think is true or false, whether it's right or wrong, it acts upon it. And so, for example, you know, you might think about something really sad that happened a few months ago and feel your eyes well up, right? It's just a thought. It's not reality. It's something in the past. Or maybe you imagine something. 
right? So um, one example is that, you you know, as human beings, we think about someone that maybe we fancy a lot. Apologies for the very visual example. And then all sorts of things happen in our body, right? The person's not here. Nothing's going to happen. Uh, but the moment we have a thought, the brain acts upon it and releases chemicals uh, that affect our emotional states. The third element is that our brain is pattern based. I said it earlier on, it's it when we repeat an activity, it creates a program that's called the autopilot. Again, a simple example, uh, if we've got drivers uh, out there, remember the first time you took a driving lesson? Oh, that was so scary. You have to concentrate, think about indicating, change gear at the same time, look in the mirror for bikes, maybe down there. Oh, please don't talk to me. I need to focus so much. And now, you get into your car, you don't have to think about anything. Your body automatically knows what to do. That's the autopilot. When we repeat an activity, it learns it off by heart. And when we find ourselves in a situation that might require that behavior, it fires it automatically. Now, scientists have been demonstrating over the past few years that you and I spend se about 70% of our waking hours in stress mode. That's a really big figure. Really, some, a lot of people usually tell me, ah, oh, no, not me, I'm very resilient. Well, scientists are also showing that we got so used to that stress mode that we don't, we don't really feel it anymore, you know? And what happens the moment we are stressed, the negativity bias kicks in and is enhanced. So what happens is that, ooh, we start seeing things for, with, with quite a dark filter. We become more and more negative. Because it's a recording device and it acts upon all our thoughts, whether they're true or false, real or unreal, uh, that creates negative emotions and often anxiety. And then there is this really bad feedback loop between thoughts and emotions. You know, you think about something um, really negative uh, for yourself or for uh, the people around you, for your environment. Of course, you start feeling awful. The more awful you feel, the more negative thoughts you're going to start feeling. And then as that loop starts creating itself, the more we have opportunities to repeat it, the brain creates uh, new patterns and our mindset becomes more and more negative. As we go through life, by definition, we grow older with a more and more negative mindset. Have you guys noticed that? Would you let me know in the chat box? I mean, in France, we've got a phrase, especially to say grumpy old man or grumpy old uh, lady. You can't be old and not be grumpy. And actually, it's a natural evolution of the brain. I mean, I don't want that. Do you want that? No, I want to go through life. I want to learn. I want to grow. I want my mindset to grow. I want to become more optimistic because I'm stronger, because I've got more resources. But naturally, the brain doesn't do that. So I'm sharing this with you because I really want to motivate you to do something really positive for yourself. And I want to really start by um, the mistakes to avoid, because people tend to think that when you work on your mindset, you work on your thoughts. And actually, ooh la la, it does not work at all that way. There is a chronology that you need to follow. And I'm going to explain this to you. I'm sure some of you are going to have like a proper aha moment here. So um, bear with me for one second. We're going to talk a little bit more science here. Um, every time you experience any form of positive emotions, um, gratitude, love, pride, excitement, joy, um, that blue curve shows your heart rate variability. So you know, guys, when you're told that your heart rate is um, 80 beats per minute, for example, that's an average because your heart never beats twice at the same uh, rhythm. It's com it's, it changes all the time. 80 beats per minute is an average, right? So you see when you feel positive emotions, uh, your nervous system is always out of stress when you feel these emotions. You're always in rest and digest. You feel calm. You see that heart rate variability, the change in speed in the heart beating, is, is, a, lovely, uh, is a lovely curve, right? It increases and decreases, increases and decreases. It's very smooth. It changes all the time. 
but it's very smooth and that is totally normal. When your heart beats in this manner, the activity in your brain is in the neocortex, the part of your brain you use to access your working memory, uh, all your learnings and past experience, to see the bigger picture, to um, assess situations from an objective perspective, to make fast, smart decisions. Um, now, every single time you experience any form, and, and sorry, and this is called a coherent state. This is the optimum state of um, functioning for your mind and your body. Your, your immune system is working at peak performance. It's repairing your body. You can think straight. You've got a lot of clarity and you feel calm. Now, every single time you experience negative emotions, that red curve is now your heart rate variability. So your heart goes like that, faster, slower, faster, slower, faster, slower, completely erratically, faster, 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 slower, slower. Um, just, just saying it, I'm tired. Now, I want to ask you questions. Um, imagine you're driving your car following that speed curve, the red one. What do you think would happen to your car? <laughs> Let me know in the chat box. You don't need to be uh, like a, a petrol head to know the answer. What would happen to your car if you were constantly and erratically accelerating and braking randomly? Anybody would like to share in the chat box? I can't see anything coming up. Yeah, I would crash. Absolutely, guys. But what would happen to the car? I'd be insane. I'd be a bad driver. I'd be a danger to myself and to others. Yeah, I love what you're saying. All of you, right? Joanne, Karen, you're right. Go, Leanne, we're getting there. Yeah. You would use a lot of petrol. You would burn. The car would burn out. Uh, the car would damage. It would break down the engine, the brakes, absolutely everything. It's wear and tear, and it's consuming a lot of energy. It's exactly the same thing that happens to your body, guys. Every single time you experience stress or negative emotion, it's damaging every single one of your organs. But what also happens, and it uses a lot of energy, and it leads to burnout, for sure. But what also happens is that the blood moves back to the more primitive part of your body. And the neocortex, the part of the brain you use to rationalize, to make decisions, is not irrigated anymore. We call this flipping the lid. So if you think your brain, if you can see me on the screen, I'm not really sure. Um, can you guys actually see my slides? I'm quite concerned that I don't see them on my second screen. Oh, you can. OK, that's lovely. This is really weird. <laughs> Your brain is, um, is a bit like that. At the center is the primitive part, the amygdala, the stress center, the emotional center. And then this is the neocortex, right? The, the forehead, the rational part. The moment you're stressed, all the blood comes here and we call it flipping the lid. This part of the brain, the rational uh, one, because it's not irrigated, it disconnects from the other part of the brain. You can try to rationalize your way out of a difficult emotional situation as much as you like. Your brain is disconnected. You, you know, you're not going to feel it in your body. Really, what I'm uh, trying to say is that having a positive mindset is not about ignoring difficulties. It's very important even when you have a positive mindset, especially when you have a positive mindset, to recognize how you feel. Because when you recognize, you can take action to change things. Because in a battle between emotions and reasons, emotion always win. Always. Because of this disconnection from uh, the uh, top part of the brain, from the rest of the brain, you can rationalize as much as you like, you're not really going to feel it in your body. And again, guys, um, can I uh, ask you in the chat box again, give me a, something, a yes or whatever. Uh, the example is, think about uh, maybe you had a, a heartache, a breakup, a difficult breakup in the past. And you know it's for the best. That person is really not, it was really not for you. You know this breakup is for the best, but you feel really sad. You feel really upset, you feel hurt, you feel emotionally distressed, and you might have a conversation with a friend and you rationalize. And yeah, it's for the best. Does it, does it mean that you feel better? Absolutely not. That's because of the disconnection. What I'm trying, I can see um, some yeses coming through in the chat box. That's because of the disconnection. 
the most important thing to do when you want to work on your mindset is not to start working with your mind, but to start working with your physiology, working with your body so that you bring the blood back to the neocortex. Here, the lead comes back. And then when you do some mindset work, the brain is fully connected and you feel it inside your body. And I think that's one of the big mistakes people make is that they rationalize with their conscious mind, but they talk, they talk, and they try to find solution and they push themselves to change their perspective. Do they feel better? Not really, right? So the first tip I want to share with you is to start with your body and with your physiology to reach that state of coherence. It's not very complicated to move from that red curve to the blue curve. That's our aim. And I want to share with you one super exercise, which is called heart focused breathing. I'm going to put my timer on my phone just to show you how easy it is in three minutes to feel different. I assume all of you are sitting. If you're standing, that's fine too. I just would like you to stay in stillness, not move anymore. Uncross your legs, both feet flat on the floor, and just make sure that you've got quite an erect posture. Don't slouch too much because we're going to want to use uh, as much of our lung capacity as possible. And just start by closing your eyes. And just ask yourself, how am I feeling right now? And just label your emotion, your attitude, whatever it is. And if you notice that your mindset is not so good, you're being a little bit pessimistic, it's okay. Just acknowledge. I'm a little bit pessimistic at the moment. I feel scared, for example. Now I want you to let go of that emotional attitude that you've identified in the same way as you would let go of a helium balloon. Just imagine. And now choose another emotion or another attitude that would serve you better. Like, I would like to um, feel calmer, or I would like to be more optimistic on this challenge that I'm facing. I would like to be more uh, compassionate with myself, kinder with myself, right? I would like to step away from judgment. So just choose one and then leave it to the side. And now I'd like you to focus your attention in your heart area. Placing your concentration where you think your heart is in your ribcage. And you might want to place your hand on your heart to strengthen that connection. Simply imagine that your breath is flowing in and out of your heart. Not through the nostrils, but through the heart. Breathe a little slower and deeper than usual. And that new emotion or attitude that you've chosen just imagine that you're breathing it in. And on each breath in, just say the word. So for me, it might be optimism or faith. And you just imagine you're breathing it into your heart. You remember, guys, that I told you earlier on that the brain is a dumb recording device. It acts upon every single one of your thoughts, even if they're not true, even if they're not reality. There is a lot of research that shows that by making the choice to breathe into your heart, the emotion or attitude or mindset you want, your brain starts releasing something like 1400 chemicals that will bring you closer to that attitude, to that mindset. Keep on breathing it in for a few more seconds. Allow your shoulders to relax. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. How did you find this, guys? Would you let me know in the chat box? Did you find it easy? How, how do you feel right now? Just stopping for three minutes. Some people might think, really, Steph? Are you serious? Yeah, 
This uh, technique has been developed by neurocardiologists, by doctors who study the nervous system around the heart. The moment you place your awareness in that area inside your chest, the neurons on your heart start activating, that nervous system activates. And you're tricking the brain upstairs by focusing on that breath in and out and imagining what you would like to see in terms of your mindset coming into your heart, these neurons uh, start uh, creating a um, very coherent curve and then they start communicating with the neurons up there in the head and start moving the blood. Isn't that insane? It's pretty easy, right? Once your physiology is changed, then you can start taking action to, you know, work with your mind, but you need to change your physiology first. Do we have any meditators in this group? Out of curiosity. I feel calm, I feel relaxed, lighter. Uh, <laughs> relaxing, but probably not in an open plan office, yeah? Yeah, you feel calmer, right? It, the benefits are extraordinary. Um, you will get an audio recording of that uh, little uh, exercise. It only takes about three minutes to change your physiology. There's plenty of other things you can do to change your physiology. Sometimes we're so wired, it's very difficult to sit in stillness. So put some tunes on, put your earphones on, put on some banging tunes. That is going to change your physiology and move your body. I mean, in the office, not always easy. Go to the loo and start dancing because you're changing your body rhythm. We usually, and again, it's very primitive. Usually when we dance, we are, it's imprinted in our very primitive DNA. When we dance, we're not in danger. So we move towards more coherence. Exercise is actually another way to change your physiology. Another one that is really good is posture. Uh, our posture has a massive impacts on how we feel and how uh, our heart rhythms uh, beats, you know. When, when our posture is like that, it's very likely we're not feeling so well. When we change it, that's, that's because of the mind-body connection. When we change what's going on in our body, we can change what's going on in our mind. And you know what? I love that sentence as well. When the body moves the mind grooves. Change your posture. And the last one is laughter. Laughter is just so good for us. It's a great way to reconnect the front part of our brain so that we can change our mindset. And it's, it's, it's pretty easy. And there's a lot, a lot of research that show the benefit of laughter. If you feel that dancing um, is, is not what you want to do right now, uh, a little meditative ex exercise is not what you want to do either. Uh, laugh, you know. So uh, I tell my clients often, you can make yourself laugh. Uh, you just go, ha, 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 Before you know it, you got a laugh. And just one laughter can totally change your physiology. Now, once you've changed your physiology, then you can really tackle the mind. And the second tip I want to share is be kind to yourself. Do you guys have um, um, a person living in your head talking to you all day? Uh, I mean, we all do. It's called the inner critic. It's a very primitive voice. It's the voice of fear from that primitive part of the brain. It talks all the time. And guess what? It doesn't compliment us very often, right? It tells us you're not good enough. You should have done that. Why on earth did you do this? You don't deserve that. You're not good enough. Wow. Um, if you don't celebrate yourself, the inner critic is going to take you down. You cannot shut down this voice. It's a primitive survival voice. But you can tune the volume down by actually tuning up another volume. So a few simple things. Um, I'd like to invite you to praise yourself. Every uh, My kids call this the ta-da list. Ta-da! Every evening, write down three of your achievements, three qualities you demonstrated, three lessons you've learned, three things that make you feel good about yourself. If you don't think about those consciously, the brain's going to tell you awful stuff about yourself. And I say write down because there is a power in journaling. Personally, I don't journal my Tada list, but at night, when I'm about to close my eyes, lights off, I'm ready to sleep. I just review my day. 
and I try to find three achievements. And if you think about it, you will find three of them. And it could be anything. Maybe you kept your cool while your kids were driving you nuts. Uh, well done. Um, maybe you had a great idea at work. Maybe you have someone crossing the street. It can be absolutely anything, big or small, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you get into the habit of counterbalancing that inner critic. Guys, can you let me know in the chat box if the inner critic is actually uh, something that um, is not making your life super easy? I think it's something that we all have, but I'd love to know if we've got like super strong mindsets already in this group or yeah, no, the inner critic is actually preventing me from, I don't know, maybe living my dreams. You're not good enough. This is a very simple way to counterbalance it. The words we use, yeah, I see, yes, definitely. My critic is always there. Use the TADA list. It's very powerful. Within a week, you're going to notice that you're going to start feeling quite different, more optimistic about yourself. Yeah. Yeah, it does happen. Um, it's, it's more or less loud depending on, on what's happened in the day, right? That's for sure. Um, check your words. Um, neuro linguistic programming is very interesting. It's the impact on wor of words on uh, our thoughts, our emotions, and our behaviors. Um, and words, the impact of these words, it's it's the same for everybody. It's the same for everybody. It's very primitive. I'd like to invite you to avoid some words that are not helpful at all. Like I can't. No. Or never use I can't. Uh, because when you say that, the brain registers that you're not good enough, right? So I can't do this, find a creative way to replace it with, I don't know how to do this yet, for example, or I actually do not wish to do that, right? I can't is a word that has a very negative impact on your mindset. I must also has quite a heavy uh, impact on our emotional well-being because it usually unconsciously means that you don't want to do it, but you really have to, or I have to. I replace that by I get to. Uh, so I tell my, ki my kids again, because I want them to grow with a stronger mindset than I had when I was their age. Uh, they're not allowed to use I must or I have to. They have to replace with it with I get to. Oh, I get to tidy my room this afternoon, mom. Thanks a lot. And super important, practice I feel versus I am. The words that follow I am follow you for the rest of your life. It drives me nuts when I hear people say, I am so stressed, um, uh, I am sad. You, when you say I am, the subconscious mind automatically takes it as a truth that defines you. And because the mind is always trying to prove you right, it's only going to identify elements in the world around you to show you that this is right. Uh, but you are not sad or you are not stressed. You feel sad or you feel stressed. These are emotions. They're temporary. All emotions are temporary. Happiness as well, sadly, actually. So practice changing your language can have a massive impact on your mindset. It's okay to feel sad. The sadness is part of life. It's okay to feel stressed. It happens. Uh, but it's not the definition of you. And... One um, amazing thing as well is that the brain is always trying to answer your questions. It will answer all your questions, always. So you ask yourself a question, it's going to look, uh, it's, first of all, it's going to register the question, it's going to go into your memory, it's going to find the answer and shout it out to you. If it doesn't find the answer in your head, then it's going to scan the world for an entire day and try to find the answer. And then it might whisper it to you in an unconscious manner. The brain answers every single question. Let me prove this to you. Guys, I'm going to ask you a very easy question. You all know the answer. I want you to think about the question, but please don't answer it in your head. Don't answer the question, right? What's the capital of England? There you go. Too late. The brain had the answer. It went and picked it up, right? So ask yourself very powerful questions. Uh, how about asking yourself, why am I so confident today? Why am I so optimistic? And it's okay, you don't need to find any answers because 
your brain now has got a question it needs to answer and as you go through your day is going to try to highlight to you things in your environment that will confirm this because it answers every single question. So instead of um, saying, oh, I'm a mess today, replace that by I feel stressed and what can I do to feel calmer? And that's it. You don't need to search for the answer. This is a great way to trick your brain to move towards a much more positive mindset. The Tadalist, checking your words and asking yourself powerful questions. What's, what's the first thing that comes to your mind, guys, when you see this, uh, <laughs> this little beauty? Anybody would like to share in the chat box the first thing that comes to your mind? A feeling, an emotion, a picture? Um, cute, 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 cute. Yeah, loving, fun. I see emojis with heart in your eyes. Absolutely. Yeah, me too. I see this. Man's best friend. I want to cuddle, fluffy and cute. Yeah, many people see that. If I ask the question to my sister, she'd say fear and disgust because she sees that. I mean, bless her, she was beaten by a dog when she was a kid. Um, what I'm trying to tell you here is that reality does not exist. This is a super important aspect of the science of happiness. We all create our own reality with the thoughts or the pictures in our head we create when something happens in our life. These thoughts and these pictures create emotions. Our emotions condition our actions, right? We don't behave the same way when we feel confident and happy or when we feel extremely stressed and anxious, right? And our actions, our behaviors create the outcomes in our life. What I'm trying to say here is that it's not what's happening in the outside world, in your life, that creates your experience of it. It's you who create the experience of it by the thoughts, the emotions and the action, by how you perceive and how you respond. That is probably the most important sort of rule of the mind from the science of happiness, because your thoughts, emotions and action, you have total control over, right? That is your zone of control. That's your response. The events, I mean, 90% of what's going on in our life is outside of our control, right? The moment you start focusing on yourself, you can build a super strong mindset, but you can really enhance your experience of life. So my tip number three is really about keeping on managing this mind of ours. Make positive statements a habit. Have you guys uh, heard about affirmations? Anybody's tried affirmations? Anybody for who affirmations work or don't work? Um, it's, it's, so affirmations, they come from um, positive psychology um, in the, I think it started like uh, around the, eight, it was born around the 80s, right? But in the 90s, we were really big. Oh, I see question mark. Okay. So affirm some people do affirmations. Uh, affirmations is simply a, a positive statement. So positive psychology in the 90s, they said, okay, uh, if you feel really rubbish, look at yourself in the mirror and say something very positive and empowering. It's going to make you feel better. Like, I'm, I am amazing. I'm a wonderful person. I deserve love. Life is abundant. Uh, every, everything happens for a reason. Uh, the universe has my back. Whatever it is that, you know, is, could be sounds empowering. The reality is that it, it does work for certain people. But affirmations have also created a lot of neurosis because the reality is that when you feel um, really unwell, when you feel anxious, when you feel stressed, when you feel your uh, confidence is, you know, very down, saying these things is not going to change that much at all, simply because you remember you say stuff that come from the cognitive function. But if your lid is completely flipped, your body is not going to register the benefits. So when I say created some neurosis, a lot of people got really frustrated thinking, but it works for some, it doesn't work for me. Why? And then it created more of the I'm not good enough and life sucks, right? There is a right way to use positive statements and affirmation. Uh, and it is when your lid is, is not flipped, it's completely attached when you're coherent. So I would say after a meditative experience, 
after high intensity exercise, because you've moved your physiology so much, uh, you've reset your nervous system, but also first thing in the morning. Because first thing in the morning, as you wake up, your brainwave frequency is uh, in low theta, high alpha. And in that phase, um, the bridge between the conscious and the subconscious mind is entirely open. So you can start planting seeds of information. I'm so sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. Um, so first thing in the morning, it's very powerful because your brain sucks it up. And with a little bit of repetition, with a little bit of repetition, you are going to be able to create a new belief for yourself. So what positive statements could you make a habit? You know, positive statements about life or about, about yourself. What could these be? You know, about life, positive ones, never a failure, always a lesson. Life is a roller coaster, I choose to have fun. Everything happens for a reason. You know, these are uh, thinking patterns that can be very helpful as long as your physiology is in the right place. Anybody's used those and find that these can be really helpful sometimes when life throws curveballs at us. It can be really helpful to think, okay, never a failure, always a lesson, right? Um, and then about yourself, right? Positive uh, statement about yourself. I'm a good and kind person. I rock. I'm awesome. I'm generous. I'm fun. I'm lovable. This is very similar to praising yourself again, uh, but repeating them once more, first thing in the morning, after meditation or after high intensity exercise, is going to help you to create empowering beliefs. Tip number four I wanna share with you is about reframing your experience. Because negative thinking is a luxury none of us can afford. You remember guys, you know, something happens, we have thoughts automatically and we create pictures in our head. Uh, these create emotional states, our emotion then conditions our behaviors and that creates the outcome. Negative thinking is absolutely terrible, not only for our mindset, but for our levels of happiness. So I want to invite you to check the stories you tell yourself about anything that's going on in your life. And if you feel that you're being upset about something, ask, your, ask the, five, the five year question. Will this really matter in five years time? Oh, not really, okay. Is this story I'm telling myself 100% true? Mm, not really. Well, take a few breaths, 10 deep horizontal heart breaths, like we did in meditation, to reset. Dance it off, you know, to reset your body. Because if the story you tell yourself doesn't really matter in the long run, or is not entirely true, and it's never entirely true because it's our perspective, right? Change your physiology and choose a more empowering story. Is there a silver lining? Is there an opportunity here for me to learn, to grow, to connect with other human beings? And there is always one. I'm going to share a, a personal uh, experience uh, actually on this one um, straight after. Uh, you guys are clear on that? I can see that some people have to leave. So um, if I may say in the chat box, there is uh, at the very top, there is a feedback form. I would love for you to take one minute to click on it to give your feedback. Uh, let me quickly share my story because I've got another 10 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to stay there because some people might think, yeah, but you know, when situations are really unhelpful, sometimes it's difficult to challenge our perspective, right? So I'm going to share an, um, a story with you guys. I had... Um, I had a terrible bike accident in April this year. Um, I completely, I dislocated my elbow, completely smashed my entire articulation and some bones in the um, upper arm and lower arm. Uh, so um, I had surgery, thank goodness for the NHS. Um, I had on my, it was uh, terrible. Anyway, I had forecast, then I had surgery. It was very complicated surgery. The, the surgeon told me even before surgery, 
I'm going to save your arm. You're still going to have an arm, but I don't know what the outcome is going to be. It could be that you're stuck like that for the rest of your life, you know, at a right angle. Thanks a lot. That's not very... I, I didn't like that story at all. And he said, you're going to have to do rehab. It's going to be very painful. It's going to be very long. But you need to push because I do my job really well, surgery. But the rehab is what is going to give you the results, right? And so I had surgery. It went really well. And then my mindset was not very empowering at all. First of all, I was in a lot of pain. I was scared. And the stories I kept telling myself were, why me? I had enough um, um, uh, crap, excuse my French, happened to me in the past year. I don't deserve that. What if my arm is stuck and I can never have a shower on my own, put my clothes on? Because it's really hard to put your clothes on when your arm is like that. Cook for my kids. You can cook with one hand. What if I can never drive? What if? And all these stories were really dragging me down. And I mean, I stayed in there for probably about three weeks. I'm not going to lie. And then I thought, Steph, your rehab is not going really well. You're not putting your heart into it. The stories you're telling yourself are not helpful. Your mindset is becoming darker and darker every day. Can you choose another story? And I found it really hard because, no, you know, the idea is not to sugarcoat a bad situation. The idea is to shine the light on something else. And I thought, okay, what story can I tell myself? Well, I can tell myself that that was totally smashed and they replaced my entire articulation. Isn't that amazing? That maybe, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago they couldn't do that. I still have an arm, right? And I've got plenty of amazing friends. I had friends come to my house and cook for my children for about a month because I couldn't do nothing. Every day I had someone turn up, do my shopping, help me out. My partner was absolutely amazing we don't live together so he couldn't look after my kids but he was helping me a lot and I thought there's a lot of love in your life focus on that you know if you were in the states you would be bankrupt for the rest of your life this would be I've been such an expensive surgery you had it for free on NHS that's another great thing to look at all this love around you then I went on internet and I wanted to see inspiring stories and I saw people who had very similar stuff who managed to actually get their life back and I thought, if they can, I can. That's what I'm going to focus on. And at first, I'm not going to lie, it was hard. I had to do it to challenge my perspective five, ten times a day. But then I got into the habit because I was repeating and repeating and the brain learns by repetition. I started becoming more and more optimistic. And guys, I mean, look today. It's I can nearly, I don't know if you can see, but I can nearly straighten my arm. That's, that's actually an amazing result. And I can, yeah, I can't touch my shoulder, but my bending is really good. What that means for me is that I can live a normal life. My arm is not perfect. It doesn't really matter. But if I hadn't had the mindset, a, a supportive mindset, I would have never gone through this, <laughs> through this rehab. Let me tell you, I mean, the guys were absolutely phenomenal. They had to hurt me, but they were so kind at the same time. So I'm not asking you to sugarcoat a potentially bad situation. I'm just asking you, can you shed the light from a different angle and maybe tell yourself a story that is more empowering, that supports you best? That's having a positive mindset. That's building a positive mindset. And then use an empowering statement. You know, my statement was everything happens for a reason. I'm going to learn, some, learn something magnificent from there. And actually, yeah, I did. I learned that maybe I should take care more of my body because my recovery was quite tough. I was really good at doing all these mind work, but I wasn't looking after my body that well, right? Now, tip number five, uh, use the power of visualization. Okay, the mind makes no difference between a thought and reality whatsoever, and you can trick it, right? Um, your best asset is your mind, if you use it right. Um, I want to share some. Um, so my tip here is when you are engaging in a challenge and you feel you could do with a better mindset, close your eyes and simply imagine the best possible outcome. You can do that in 30 seconds, right? You need to make sure your physiology is right first. So have your little dance, your little meditation and then visualize. I do that every morning when I have a, like a, 
a challenging client or um, a challenging keynote, for example, I just picture it in my head. It goes absolutely amazingly well. The outcome is great for everybody. And that's it. I want to share some um, experiments that were done. Uh, Soviet athletes at the Winter Olymp Olympics at Lake Placid. So um, it was biathlon. So biathlon, uh, they ski, uh, you know, it's flat, uh, but they run with their skis and then they stop and they need to shoot. So um, the first activity is, is uh, very anaerobic. <gasps> You're out of breath. And the second activity, you need to regulate your breathing because you don't want to move. You want to aim straight. Uh, right. So they experimented for ways of training. Um, group number one, they trained 100 percent of the time. Group number two, they did 75 percent training, 25 percent imagining in their head they were training and they were imagining success. Group three, they did 50 50 and group D, they only did 25 percent of physical training and 75 percent of imagining in the head. Which group, one, two, three, four, had the best improvement, do you think? The one who did all the training, a bit of training, a bit of imagining, or a little bit of training and a lot of imagining success? Which one do you think? One, two, three, or four? I'd love to see your answers. I mean, I'm sure you know where I'm getting at, but yeah, uh, yeah. Isn't that insane, guys? Group number four. The brain is very powerful. And we can use it to our advantage. We can trick it every day. When I, you know, when I go somewhere and I've got a big presentation to do, sometimes I get a bit nervous if there are like hundreds of people. Before I get there, sit down, I check my posture. Yeah, I stand like um, a superhero, close my eyes, and I can see it's going amazingly well. The words flow perfectly. I convey my message clearly. Great. And then I go for it. You're tricking your brain. So, um, guys, we're reaching towards the end here. I hope I've uh, given you lots of interesting ideas. I hope you've learned uh, a lot about the brain, about the body, about mindset. I hope you like the tips. But I've got to say that ideas are pretty useless without action. Nobody's learned how to swim by reading a book. You have to get into the water and practice. So I would like to give you a super easy 10 day challenge. Super easy, I promise you. I mean, it's up to you whether you want to take it or not. But I put my neck on the line. If you try this challenge, I guarantee you that within 10 days, you're going to notice massive improvements in your mindset. So let me summarize physiology. You can do meditation, hot focused breathing like we did, changing the mindset, right? Noticing what, what your mindset is like letting it go, deciding what you want, focusing on your heart and breathing it in. I'll send you a recording if you want to practice this. Exercise, dance, move your body, laugh, that's good for you. The mind is about being kind to yourself to counterbalance the inner critic. Be kind with yourself with the words you use, ask yourself empowering question, praise yourself every night and focus on the good. Have positive statements ready when you need them Repeat them first thing in the morning, after exercise, after meditation. Constantly challenge your perspective. Constantly, all day long. That's very powerful. And get into the habit of visualizing a positive outcome. I mean, as I said, I do this every morning. It doesn't take very long. I'm in bed and I've got, I've got my positive statement, which is I'm alive. I'm going to make the most out of today. And then I think about all my challenges today. Everything goes well. What a wonderful day I'm going to have. And that's it. All in all, it takes about 30 seconds. The challenge I want to give you in the morning, do three minutes of the meditation and have an affirmation for yourself and visualize the best day. In the daytime, just check your words and check your stories. Choose different stories. OK, that's there is no time commitment here. It's about paying attention. And in the evening, do another three minutes of that um, meditative exercise and praise yourself. Ta-da! I'm amazing, right? That's it. Super easy. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this session. I'm going to stop um, presenting. I'm going uh, to come back. No, I can't. 
what is going on with my computer. Here we go. I'm here to answer some of your questions if you've got any. I'm going to put the feedback 